Today is International Day Zero Tolerance for FGM, so that's why we chose to do it today. And I'm going to just give you a little bit of a run through of what we're going to, who we're going to hear from and what we're going to hear about. So um, we're going to first of all talk a little bit about what is reconstruction surgery for FGM survivors and should it be available on the NHS. Um, Natasha's going to do a wonderful presentation on psychosexual therapy and explain um, what it is and how we can use it for FGM survivors. Um, Forward are going to launch their research. Um, and then we're going to go and sit on some tables and have some group discussions and a bit of chat. We are going to record, we don't want to record anybody's name, but we're going to try and just record the discussion so we could maybe use that later um, for publication. So I'll explain that a little bit later. Um, and then we're going to launch our, well, I'm not going to, Janet's going to launch our parliamentary mm -hmm. petition. So please feel free to get up and get a drink if you need to. Um, it's very informal, it's very chilled. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. So I'm Hulam Hamlet, a few specialist in midwife with Newton. Uh, so I see whether you are subject to FGM, so you see pregnant women, young pregnant women over 18 years old. And today we're here to make changes, mark the day, and I want you to go home today thinking uh, survivors need a voice, and the voices are among you guys. So let's walk together and make the difference today. Thank you, Huda. Lovely. Uh, I'm Juliette Albert. I'm an FGM specialist in life. I work at um, the Imperial College just down the road at the Sunflower Clinic. And we're also going to hear today from Natasha Anderson Foster. Um, Natasha will introduce herself, I'm sure, when she does her presentation. Uh, Nana, as well, will introduce herself when she does hers. And um, we've also got Janet Fyle from the RCM, and Janet also will say, I'm sure, a little bit about herself when, when um, she does her presentation. So, who are we and <laughs> why are we here? Um, we call ourselves the Restore Project at the moment. This is subject to change, so we're going to. One of our questions in our group discussions is going to be to ask you guys if you if you like that name or if you think there's a, we should have a different name. Um, we're a group of FGM experts, so we are. There are in, within our group there are FGM survivors or women with lived experience of FGM. There are various different healthcare professionals. Uh, midwives, doctors, counsellors or therapists, and health advocates and we also have charity workers and campaigners um, and we all voluntarily meet once a month for an hour on a Monday at 6 o'clock and try and, <laughs> and talk about what we're, what we're, what we're going to do next um, and why are we doing it. So basically we are looking into establishing a national centre of excellence, offering reconstruction surgery and psychosexual therapy for FGM survivors provided by the NHS within a research setting. So I'm going to explain what that means because there's lots of kind of words in there. Um, oh, I gone? So yeah, the aims of the project. So we've been looking at the evidence really that underpins. Sorry, yeah. Can we get the slides later? Because we're all scribbling away. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll send you the slides. Don't scribble. We can definitely forward them. As long as you wrote your, your email address or your phone number clearly, you can definitely. I'll send them to everyone. Um, so we, we want to, first of all, we've been reviewing the evidence that underpins reconstruction surgery. Um, we want a new service, but for us, it's really important that that service is co designed with the women that might be using it. So we want to co-design it as a collaboration. Um, and that means having patient and public involvement, and that means having a very inclusive and transparent process. We, we have realised that we have to lobby as part of that project, because that's how you get change, I guess. So lobbying the Department of Health, the NHS, so that we can generate a tariff for women. That means basically to make sure that um, clinicians who do reconstruction surgery get paid for it. And we need, basically, NHS need to kind of commission a service. So it has to be done properly. 
what we don't want is for women to have to go privately and pay for it, basically. Um, we want to publish about what we're doing because that's how we share our information. And we want money. We need, we need a grant, hopefully from the NIHR, which is the kind of, uh, it's basically the research arm of the NHS. We're going to be applying for a lot of money, and we want the money to pay for the research and the service. And we've already actually got a web page, and on that web page we want to create some materials with basically information um, for everybody about what is reconstruction and again why, why we're doing this project. So, what is reconstruction surgery? Do you want to explain? <laughs> So we're aiming to, originally, so basically we're aiming for those who undergo um, FGM, so they have the scar tissue, nerve damage, especially when you involve the survivors, there's different types, you've got type 1, type 2, type 3. Type 1 is the movement of fetus food, and sometimes women end up with long-term complications, nerve damage, and when they come to us, they start to move to doing any movement. Type 2, again, genitalia, maybe a normal move, small lips, maybe a matura, and again, they end up with nerve damage. Sometimes they have um, they have problems with urinating, they have problems with their period, they have problems with their infancy, they have ongoing pain, they can't even sit down and keep jobs. Mm -hmm. yeah? And those women will explain to you when they come to the clinic, I feel like there's cyst growing in my genitalia. But there's no cyst growing, it's a nerve damage. The next comes hyperstimulating, so they cause really pain. And you've got women who also got type 3, so removal of the total Leave menorah, clitus screen, and everything's removed. So the scar tissue, small opening, we open the scar tissue, and that's it. So they're left with low soft skin, um, difficult intimacy, long term, both mental and physical for women. And really, uh, when we talk to those survivors, they have no, you have no idea. Every night they live with that body image, the trauma that they became as children. But they want closure. They want to feel whole again. And there's a service that we can do. Unfortunately, it's not available in India. And then to improve the um, sexual function, also to reduce pain. So all those things comes into the constructions which we don't have in India. So that's all. Yeah. Next slide. So the mer three most common reasons why women seek you know, construction, like I said, to take your pain, improve the sexual pleasure, body image concerns. Yeah. So there are different techniques for reconstruction surgery. So one of the things to say is there are 26 clinics across Europe that offer reconstruction surgery. So in uh, Sweden, Spain, Italy, France, Germany, the Netherlands. Um, and in France, they've been doing reconstruction surgery since 1998. So we're, we're way behind, it seems, in the UK. And there are different techniques for reconstruction surgery. So part of our work is to look into this and bring together a multidisciplinary team of surgeons to basically make sure we get the best technique possible. <coughs> and this was just to try and explain a little bit more about exactly what reconstruction surgery is. So basically, in some cases, what the surgeon would be doing is to pull up the root of the clitoris that's remaining under the skin, because if you imagine the top little bit may have been removed, what we call the clitoral glands, so they, they might pull up the root and that might give more sensation and for, for body image as well and it might relieve some pain. Sometimes they might even be taking some tissue from another part of the body and using that instead. So it's kind of like grafting um, a clitoral glands. And then some of the surgeries is more, is also, sorry, looking at creating lips. So if the lips have been removed or for some women the inner lips uh, there's only on one side or partially removed. So the idea about reconstruction is there's, as I said, there's different techniques. There is, this one is, this is very technical. Um, and this is kind of explaining again the different techniques. So I will forward the presentation to anyone who wants it and then you can see there's a reference at the bottom if you want to read about it in a bit more detail about the different techniques. So the other thing just to say is, I think Huda made it quite clear as well. For some women, we can't really help them at the moment. We're like, we're not sure what to do to help them. So, for example, with pain during sexual intercourse, um, you might be offered lub lubricants, 
you know, like some uh, lubricating jelly, um, <laughs> some kind of hormonal cream you might be offered. You might be told to avoid activities like cycling because it might put pressure on the area. Uh, you might get to see the physio. I know we've got some lovely physios mm -hmm. here. Hello, lovely to see you mm -hmm. here. Um, you might even be offered kind of some sort of anaesthetic gel. But one of the things we're not offering is surgery to sort of try and put back what's been taken away. And that's missing for families. And for those of us that work in clinics, we're finding that people have heard about reconstruction through maybe social media, friends and family, and they're saying to us, can we have that? And we've got nothing, we'd like, sorry, we just don't do that here. So I think a lot of particularly people who work in the specialist services are feeling really strongly that we've got to change something. And also the younger women now, the younger, they are, you know, they're reading about social media and, you know, they know the European country, what they're doing, and the question mark is, why are we not getting here? So they feel like if they have money, they would have gone and get it. So if we have cases who actually said funded is so expensive and the outcome is always, you know, the healing process, it takes a year maybe, and we have to also, um, that money comes into the NHS as well. So it's a long term um, support that we really need. Yeah, one of the things is that if women have to have it done privately, they're going abroad, and that means they've got to travel there, they've got to pay for a hotel to stay perhaps, they've got to pay for the surgery. Also, we don't want women going underground and seeking it out privately perhaps in this country by somebody who's unregulated. Um, so there, these are the reasons why we want the NHS to provide this service. So the other thing is psychosexual therapy is really important. Oh. Natasha's going to explain all of that to us, but I think that what we can see very clearly is very, very few clinics have a psychosexual therapist co-located in, and we're just not offering it very often in the UK, whereas actually a lot of the clinics in Europe have got a psychosexual therapist working there. Um, we find that it's, it's possible that for some women having psychosexual therapy means they then decide they don't need or want surgery anymore, and we want to make sure women have that option, because obviously, <coughs> Basically, surgery can be risky. We all know that. Any surgery is not 100% always successful. And so we need to make sure that women are really properly and safely prepared before surgery and have the right support afterwards as well. So for us, trauma therapy, but also psychosexual therapy is really important. So I wanted to just give you a very brief example of a clinic that's running in Belgium. They call it Semavi which uh, obviously I went to be Belgium, but Medical Centre in Aid of Victims who have a case issue. Um, they did reconstruction surgery for 107 women between 2014 and 2016. It's reimbursed by Belgian Social Security, so they don't have to actually you know, pay. And it's run by a gynecologist, a midwife, a psychologist, and a sexologist. And one thing that's really interesting about it is they have to, it's mandatory for the women to have five consultations. And I think that's really interesting because it's meant to safeguard the women. The idea is then they're not just turning up one day and having surgery straight away. They're, there's a process that they go through to make sure they're really, really ready and it's safe for them. So for example, this is the pathway within that Belgian clinic. And one of our questions is to, to be asking whether you guys think that's a good idea too, basically. Um, so in that clinic, it's not a paper that's really reporting on the outcomes, but one of the things that they, some of the things they've said is there were, there were no deaths or life-threatening complications, but healing can sometimes take quite a long time. I mean, 12 weeks is, is a long time, isn't it? Um, the pain can be severe and it can trigger memories, upsetting memories, and there are sometimes some short-term Complications. So, for example, bleeding, uh, stitches coming undone, infection, urine retention, as you'd expect for any so genital surgery. Yeah. So, just to say, we have done a scoping review already. Uh, it's hopefully going to be published by the British Journal of Obstetrics. We reviewed 40 publications, so these are kind of academic publications that were looking at reconstruction, and in total, these are just those that are published, so this is not the number of women overall in the whole world who've had reconstruction, but this is just from these papers, 
there were, as you can see, 7,751 women underwent surgical reconstruction. That was between 2012 and you know, basically 2022. 40% um, saw an actual multidisciplinary team. So for us, that's really important. We're really advocating a multidisciplinary team. Um, 15 studies had some psychosexual counseling, so not all of them. That's 37.5%. 97% of women reported an improvement after reconstructive surgery. And you can see afterwards things like sexual function, pain, body image, bulb and appearance, um, intimate relationships. So, you know, there were, there were things that different people were pleased with different things, if you see what I mean. And there were some complications, but look how few, 3.9%. So, in terms of surgery, that is really, you know, really, really good, really successful. So, do you want to do a little bit about why the project's important? Should I keep going from there? No, that's fine. I'll keep, I'll keep. Okay. either way. Okay, so, we know there's no service in the UK. Uh, I've already said there's lots of services, not just in Europe, but also in parts of Africa, um, in the USA, um, in France, more than 6,000 patients since 1998. So this is not new surgery. This is being done in lots of different places, but just not here. Um, we know that not all women who've had FGM want reconstruction. We're not suggesting that, okay? It's really just that they could have access to it if they want to. So that's, that's a really important point. Um, we think this is a health inequality, it's a social injustice, and it's unethical. Yeah, I think it's a race of the choice. Yeah. So, um, so the women who come to us, and also the study shows, a majority of them, when they have the counseling and the assessment and what have you, remember what I said to you, someone will actually go through pain, so they do go to surgery. There's no option for them. They, they have to have some sort of surgery input. So those women who would have the psychosexual therapy, um, I remember meeting Jasmine after that, and she sometimes said you, she's a... Uh, a consultant who does surgery in Switzerland, and she's been doing over 10 years now, so yeah, yeah, and she said the majority of women who come to her, they do the counseling, and some women will say, thank you so much, I'm happy what you showed me, and I'm going to go home, but some women will need the surgery because of pain, because of self-esteem, so they can make them better, but the option has to be there for the woman to decide what they want to do, and the survivors we see in our clinics are exactly inequality, ethical. why? Why is this not happening in the UK? Why is where actually the evidence shows this works, yeah? So, um, in the UK, you know, women can access post-cancer vulval surgery, um, gender reassignment surgery, you know, you can make a man's genitals into a woman's genitals in this country. It's free, those things are free on the NHS. So why don't we have it here? And I've already said, you know, there are health risks associated with going abroad to have it done or doing it kind of underground. Um, this is really important. Why do we want to make it kind of part of research? Um, I, I, I'm concerned that women will be worried that they're kind of guinea pigs, you know. And obviously, the first women that have reconstruction in this country, it, it will be new. But what we will make sure is that the surgeons are properly trained. So myself and Dahlia are going off to Geneva next week to get some training. And hopefully everybody, yeah. lots of people will. The masterclass is yeah. also online. So if you can't travel, I'm, I'm going to be online as well. So you can do online. It's quite interesting. Yeah. Um, so we want it to be we want it to be in a research setting because we want to contribute to the evidence base. Number one, we know that the WHO said that there wasn't enough evidence to recommend reconstruction. So we need to contribute to that evidence. If you do something within a research setting, so like a clinical trial, it means you have really, really, really strict ethical guidelines. Believe you me, I know because I've been recently having to go through that process. It's really tough. And it has to be transparent, it gets really well scrutinised. I mean, actually, in the UK, we're really brilliant at research. Um, and we lead in a lot of areas in research. Um, and we want to fund the service, so the research is going to help actually fund the setting up of the service. So the drivers are, as I said earlier, women requesting reconstruction. Um, we, we say we want to deliver patient-centered care, so why aren't we listening to what patients say they want? Um, 
We want to improve outcomes for women, but also for their families, for communities, and actually it reduces the burden on the NHS because if we had more um, surgery that women want, then there'll be fewer maybe mental health issues going on. So those kind of things are really important, as well as gentle pain, um, obviously sexual function as well. So, so far, we did get a £10,000 grant from the Urology Foundation. Thank you to them for paying for some of the food. We've got a web page. We've submitted our scoping review. We've done already some workshops. A workshop with patients, not patients, sorry, that's the wrong word, with FGM survivors to ask them what they think about reconstruction surgery. We're hoping today is going to be our stakeholder, national stakeholder meeting, so that's why we're going to involve you in some of our decision making. We have set up a parliamentary petition, which we're going to show you later, and we've partnered with Oxford Surgical Trials Unit, they're really hot, they're really on it, I should say, this Oxford Surgical Trials Unit, and they're kind of scrutinising what we're doing and, and helping us, supporting us. Um, and patient and public involvement is so, so, so important because basically you're the expert and you are making sure we're accountable for what we're doing. You're, you're helping make decisions, so we're co-designing, co-producing, and you can help us share this information and spread this information. So our members, so far, this is not everybody, but most of us are here, not everybody can make it today. Um, these are some of our members. These are saying who, who we are and what we do. Um, there's quite a few of us actually. <laughs> it's, it's growing. Um, and like I said, everybody's joining for free in their own time um, because they care about this issue. Um, and thank you to Forward. Forward have contributed to our lovely food, and Nana's going to speak to us later. The Urology Foundation, and Susie O'Neill, who isn't here and I think isn't going to be able to make it. She's stuck in surgery in theatre. Um, but her Pelvic Care Fund also has contributed some funding. So thank you very much to all our funders. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. This is just uh, to, so you hear a little bit more about Ford soon. Uh, the Urology Foundation. We've also got lovely Hecate from Man and Gardens who are supporting us. Part of the project, Midday, uh, Royal College of Midwives, and uh, uh, Holistic Support, yeah. So thank you so much for listening. <laughs>